Okay, brothers and sisters of Christ, we got done with who is on the throne, which is very important. Now we're going to talk about who's on the cross. When you get saved, you go to Calvary and you get a cross. Okay, an empty cross. So who is on the cross? Present tense in the life of a saved sinner. Now, brothers and Christ, we had to go to South Calvary. Now, is Jesus on the cross? Or are you on the cross? Is the world on the cross? Is your flesh on the cross? Satan, anytime Satan and his ministers try to are you making sure that you're on the cross? But this is Christ. Is Jesus on the cross or are you on the cross? Now imagine, real quick, we just got to finish doing the throne. Okay, the throne, Jesus being on the throne. You've got a throne over here. You've got a throne over here. These represent two different men. How many times have you seen brethren butt heads? Especially in ministry. Brethren are button heads. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contentions. One or both sides are prideful. So you see, imagine two men, one on the throne over here, one on the throne over here. And you just, it's like a cartoon, it's like just stick figures. And you see, beep, 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 he's arguing, beep, 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 he's arguing, beep, 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 he's arguing, beep, 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 he's arguing. Next thing you know, they both jump off the thrones, bend their heads down and charge each other, and boom, headbutt, boom. And then they go back onto their throne. Beep, 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 beep. And they jump off their thrones and they start charging each other and boom! They go back to the throne and they start... Rrr, rrr. These are men that are butting heads, okay? And they're arguing and they're fighting. Imagine that, okay? Then, a stick figure, because I don't know what Jesus looks like, I'm not going to say imagine a Jesus, but Jesus comes walking out and he's standing right in the center. And he looks over at this guy, he looks over at that guy. Both thrones are occupied. So the whole time he's sitting there looking, he's watching them go burr, 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 burr. They jump off the throne, their thrones, they come and butt heads, boom, right in front of Jesus, and then run back, burr, 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 burr. and Jesus standing there, he's looking. So he walks off, comes back with a big two by four, a big long board, sets it on the ground. He sits there and he looks at both guys. They're still doing the same thing. The thrones are occupied. So he walks off the screen again, comes back with a smaller board, puts it down, looks them both. Oh, the thrones are still occupied, and they're still button heads and fighting. So then you see, so you see him, he's hammering, he's hammering, he's hammering, and he puts it up, it's a cross. And he climbs back on it. You say, what's this picture of? Where else does Jesus have to go? Brother says Christ, when Jesus is not on the throne and you kick him off the throne, where else does he have to go? He's got to go back to the cross. That's what, and you're making him go back to the cross. So let's talk about what, to remind the brethren, what, remember, Jesus is not going to die on the cross a second time, a third time, a fourth time. It's not a perpetual thing. I'm not saying that. I'm saying a picture of, if you won't let Jesus on the, on the, the throne, then you're putting Jesus back on the cross. It's the only two places in a saved sinner's life that Jesus can be. He can be on the throne, or he can be on the cross. He's supposed to be on that throne. What was it like for Jesus to be on the cross? Turn to Isaiah 53.5. Isaiah 53.5. Do you guys remember what Jesus Christ went through to pay for our sins? Why do you keep trying to put Jesus back on the cross? So you don't have, I don't want to be on the cross, so you make Jesus get back on the cross. Why? Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Hopefully that noise, I have a heater on. It is cold. <laughs> um, so hopefully that noise isn't taking over my talking. So I apologize. Just turned it off. Take a few minutes for it to get turned off. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes we are healed? Yeah. What did Jesus have to go through? Do you guys remember? He had his beard ripped out. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was cussed at. He was mocked. He was whipped within an inch of his life. They paraded him half naked 
all the way to Calvary. They nailed him to the cross. And there he bled out and died. He said, it is finished. John 19.30 John 19.30 When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. When you kick Jesus Christ off the throne, where else does he have to go? He's got to go back to the cross to remind you. I've always said this, brothers of Christ. I, when it comes to somebody who I believe is saved, and they get so messed up with the world that they just look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes, they're not being good ambassadors for Jesus Christ, which we talked about in the previous video. They're not acting like ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You go back to the first step. What's the first step? You preach salvation to them again. You remind them who it is that saved them, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they serve. Who's supposed to be on the throne? Brother says Christ. John uh, 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Please understand, I'm not saying Jesus is getting on the throne to be sac uh, on the cross to go through another sacrifice. No, he's, I'm just saying an image to remind you, do you remember what Jesus went through? When Jesus said it is finished, it is finished. He's supposed to be on the throne, and now you're supposed to take up your cross daily and follow him. You're supposed to crucify the flesh. I'm getting ahead of myself. That gets into who's, if you're on the throne, or on the cross, I'm sorry. If you get off the throne and let Jesus on his throne in your heart, and you get on the cross. Mm -hmm. But I'm just reminding you what Jesus went through. He said it is finished. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ his Son? Do you remember what Jesus went through on the cross? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean to have Jesus Christ on the cross instead of the throne? When you are on the throne and you make Jesus go back to the cross, you have how many times do you come across people that have this attitude? Oh, Jesus will forgive me. No, it's under the blood. Why you plan to sin? I'm telling you, I'm serious. There's a lot of false converts, but I even almost got I got tempted to do it a couple times. You see, the flesh comes and tempts you. The world comes and tempts you. Satan and his ministers come to tempt you. And they say, well, you know, maybe if you play a game for just a little bit. Oh, God will forgive you. God, how I many of you heard this? God understands. God understands that you're, uh, you're, you're sinful condition. And he understands. When you're on the cross, you kick Jesus back. I mean, on the throne. You kick Jesus off the throne and you make him go to the cross. Because you're going to live your way. and I've heard this from people so many times. Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, God will forgive me. They say this why they plan on sinning. They plan on doing things their way. I want, I want. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when I'm in sin and wickedness, and I have been sometimes, the last thing I need a brother and sister in Christ to do is to come pat me on the back and say, Oh, God understands. It's okay. It's under the blood. God will forgive. That's not what I need to hear. If I'm in present tense sin, what I need is a correction. The Bible says all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I need my sin called out for what it is. Yes, what you're doing there is wrong. Yes, what you're doing there is sinful and wicked. You need to give it up for the Lord. You need to repent and forsake. And until I repent and forsake, that's what I need to hear from a brother in Christ. Get that sin out of your life. You're doing wrong. You need to stop doing it. But when I was a false convert at these easy believism, anytime I felt like I'm doing something wrong or I'm doing this and everything... 
At the time, I was addicted to porn, Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, and, and the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. I was okay with everything else, but I kind of, I had a, like, you know, good, the laws of God that are written on your heart. Uh, I was told porn was wrong. And when I mentioned that to those guys, they just said, Oh, don't worry about it. God understands. God knows. God will forgive. Not one of them said, Hey, you need to get that sin out of your life. I wasn't saved. They weren't saved. They were part of this movement that, oh, God understands. No, when we have a brother or sister in Christ that's going down the wrong path, we need to use the scriptures to convict them to get back on the right path. Okay. Now, that being said, brother says Christ, there's a difference between being right in the middle of the sin, and there's a difference between, there's times where I do sit there and I talk with the Lord, and I old sins that I've repented and I've forsaken and I've gotten my heart right with the Lord, sometimes those sins come creeping back, the knowledge of those sins come creeping back, and I can get down for a little while saying, Lord, how could I have ever done that? How could I have failed you? Then you come to that brother or sister in Christ that's in that state, and then you tell them, did you repent? Did you forsake? Yes. Then let it go. You've given it to God. Let it go. Get back to your walk with God. Don't let the past sins get you down. Past sins that you've repented and forsaken, don't let them get you down. But this easy believism, I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit, but this easy believism, this whole thing about whipping them again, whip them again, whip them again, that's what they have that attitude. Romans 6 1. Turn to Romans 6 1. They have that attitude, oh, they just charge it. I got in trouble with the easy believism, and I'm laughing a little bit because it's just uh, one of those laughs that's just unbelievable because it's so true. They treat uh, what Jesus Christ did on the cross, they treat it like a credit card. Oh, I, I can just swipe the credit card and charge the plan on sinning and live my way. I can have me on the throne, the flesh on the throne, the world and the people in the world on the throne. I can have, let, even let Satan and his ministers be on the throne. And I just keep charging it. I just charge my sins. Oh, I just keep charging it. Oh, if I'm doing something wrong, if I'm believing something wrong, oh, God will forgive me. And they treat it like a credit card. What Jesus did for us on the cross, brother says Christ, it's not supposed to be treated like a credit card. It's not supposed to be used now as justification for sin and wickedness and folly. Romans 6.1 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? This is after salvation. After what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's how these easy believism act. They got, a, they got a card and they just keep charging it so, so God's grace can abound. God's grace can abound. We just continue living in sin, living however we want, and they just keep charging, charging, charging. They plan on sinning and they use the excuse, oh, God will forgive me. Okay. Verse 2. If you're truly saved and born again, brother says Christ, eternally God has forgiven you. When it comes to eternal salvation and not going to hell and spending eternity in hell in the lake of fire, yes, God, God already forgave you at the cross. But there's still consequences in this life for your sins. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's for today. There are rewards you're losing in heaven. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not talking about eternal salvation. If you're saved, you're saved. If you're sealed into the day of redemption, you're sealed into the day of redemption. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about salvation in this life. The Bible talks about how if your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. And if you pervert it too much, God will kill you and bring you home early. That's a fearful thing. To get killed and come home early and you have nothing to show for your life as a Christian up there? Because you just decided you wanted to live your way? You didn't want Jesus Christ on the throne? Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How, are we, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The changed life. Now, like I said, the studies for brothers and sisters of Christ who've had the changed life, but now you're falling back into the old way, the old man. 
You've kicked Jesus off the throne. He was on the throne. I didn't say he was never on the throne. That's a lost person. If he was never on the throne to begin with, that person never got saved. This is for brethren who Jesus was on the throne, and you've kicked him off the throne and let somebody else sit there. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? When you went to the cross in true biblical repentance and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you gave the old man, that old man that loved sin, that wanted sin, that was the, you know, Paul says, I'm the cheapest of sinners. He's talking about at salvation. You know how many people take that verse and misuse it today to justify sin in the life of a Christian? Oh, well, Paul said he was the cheapest of sinners, so, you know, sin's just part of the life of a Christian. He was talking about salvation. At salvation, he was the chiefest of sinners. And if God can save him, he can save anyone. And I'm not calling Paul a liar, but I have the same attitude that Paul has. At salvation, I was the chiefest of sinners. And if God can save a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner like me, he can save anyone. Now, brothers and Christ, today, today, I'm not that same man. I'm not that filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell. Now I am a saved sinner, and God has cleaned up my life, and I strive to be holy as I am holy. Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. I strive to live for Jesus Christ. I'm way cleaner and way better man today than I was when I was lost. And I owe it all to Jesus Christ. That's the life of a Christian. But Jesus Christ has to be on the throne. And you have to be on the cross. We are baptized into his death. The old man is dead and buried. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him in baptism, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Jesus died on the cross to save us from hell, but also to save us from ourselves. Because ourselves were the reason we're going to hell. Our sin and wickedness. That's why we're going to hell. He saved us from ourselves. There's supposed to be a new life. And like I said, these people with that credit card, whip him again. Rip out more of his beard. Not enough of his beard was ripped out. Spit in his face again. Mock him again. Call him some more names. I'm not taking pleasure in saying these things. That's easy believism. Brothers is Christ, we're not supposed to line up with them. But I see some brethren starting to line up with them. Oh, I can sin. God will forgive. I can sin. God will forgive. I can do things my way a little bit. And it never is a little bit, brothers is Christ. It starts out that way. Just, just for ten minutes. I can play some games for just ten minutes. I can watch one episode of one of my old, the old TV shows that I watched when I was lost. Or oh, that, that sinful, wicked movie. Uh, you know, I can watch one, it's just one more time. But that one more time turns into 20 times. That 10 minutes turns into 6 hours. I can do what I want just a little bit of the time. Just certain areas of my life. I can do what I want over what God wants. Next thing you know, your whole life is about what you want. And God doesn't even play a factor in it as far as what he wants. You're saved. I believe you're saved. But you fall into that trap. Whip him again. Where's the sorrow? It starts at salvation, that repentance. And it's supposed to continue on in the life of a Christian. When you sin against God, you're supposed to be sorry. And you're supposed to fall down before the throne in your heart and make sure Jesus is on it and say, Lord, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Let me pick up my cross again to remind me of what you went through and that I'm supposed to be putting the flesh down. I'm supposed to be putting the world down. I'm supposed to be putting Satan and his ministers down. I'm supposed to be on that cross. And I've got to remember what Jesus Christ did for me. Every time you drop that cross, you forget what Jesus Christ did for you. And you start getting back into the sin and wickedness of the world. 2 Corinthians 13.5 2 Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. 
Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. That's what communion is all about, brother, says Christ. I don't have this in my notes reading about communion, but um, I think it's in uh, Corinthians about uh, I always misspell it. Forgive me. Yes, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Okay, But that's what communion is all about. It's about examining your life. Is Jesus Christ on the throne? And am I taking up my cross daily? Am I a good ambassador for Jesus Christ? Am I living right? Am I believing what's right? Is this the foundation? We're going to get into some studies that do a test to see if you've been infected and riddled with the disease of yea hath God said a better rendering would be. We're going to get around to those. But is this the foundation of my life? That's what communion's for. Okay? That is what communion's for. Now, sadly, I've done this in my saved life before. Talked myself into Hebrews 11.25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people. Give me just a second. It's nice to get up. Please forgive me. We'll go back. Um, sadly, I've done this to say in my saved life before, where I've sat there and said, and I, I've talked myself into getting back into wickedness and sin, and I've talked myself into overlooking certain things and compromising with the world and everything. Why? Oh, God will save me. Or, I mean, God saved me. God will forgive me. God will forgive me. I talked myself into it. Remember Hebrews 11.25, it says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasure of sin for a season. Now turn that around. Rather to enjoy pleasure of sin for a season than to choose rather to suffer affliction with God's people, the people of God. Start getting into sin, idolatry, wickedness. Just for a little bit, just a little bit. God will forgive me. I failed the Lord. I know how enticing it can be. you got to get it out, brothers says Christ. Yes, when you repent and forsake, God will forgive you after you've repented and forsaken it. I'm not talking about eternal salvation. I'm talking about present tense salvation. The life that we live down here for Jesus Christ, our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. Sin gets in the way. Remember, we read about how they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Talking about that spiritual kingdom, that fellowship, all the lust of the flesh, the worldliness. It gets in the way of your walk with the Lord. What do you got to do? You got to get it confessed and repented and get it out of your life so you can get that walk with the Lord back. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know the power of God unto salvation? The power of the gospel? It's the new birth after salvation. That's the evidence of the power of the gospel. We're sealed. That's the first thing. We're sealed into the day of redemption. You get saved. You're going to heaven. You have eternal life. God promised it. You're sealed. Now, the evidence of that power that God saved you from hell and the lake of fire is the changed life. And anytime you start going back to being the old man, you start being ashamed of the gospel. You stop being a good representation of being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Is Jesus on the cross? Did you try to put Jesus back on the cross? Oh, he'll forgive me. Oh, he'll forgive me. There's times where I kicked Jesus off the throne and put him on the cross and I got to sit on the throne. Or I compromised so the world could sit on the throne. And I had to kick whoever was on the throne, even if it was my own butt kicking my butt off that throne, to put Jesus back on the throne where he belongs. And I had to get back to that cross. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Brothers and sisters Christ, you can get back to Jesus Christ being on the throne and you carrying your cross around daily. Okay? When Jesus is on the throne, it's because you're in sin and wickedness. That's why he died for us, is for our sin and wickedness. 
You want Jesus on, I mean, Jesus on the cross, forgive me. When Jesus gets kicked off the throne, he's got nowhere to go but the cross. To remind you of what he did for you and who it is that you're bought with a price, that you're not your own. What, what's it like when you get everyone off the throne and say, that's Jesus' throne, Lord, and you fall down on your knees before that throne in your heart and Jesus is on the throne, Okay. And you're carrying your cross around with you. And you're putting the flesh, you're crucifying the flesh on the cross. The ways of the world on the cross. Anytime Satan tries to come in and get into your life, you take Satan and his ministers and you throw them on the cross. Okay? And you carry that cross with you to remind you what Jesus Christ did for you. What I mean by throwing Satan in his ministers, I'm talking about, you're basically saying, I don't want this. You're getting rid of it. I don't want this sin. You throw it on the cross to get rid of it. You don't use the cross as justification for that sin. You use the cross to get rid of it. The ways of the world. You throw it on the cross to get rid of it. Luke 9.23. Turn to Luke 9.23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. You have to deny yourself. And then take up your cross daily and follow me. Repent. Forsake and get back to your walk with the God. You're, get back to walking with God. Give him back his seat. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What did they do to Jesus? They sacrificed him on the cross. You have to keep putting your flesh on the cross to put it down and sacrifice it, saying, you're not in charge. The man on the throne is. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in charge, not my flesh. Jesus Christ is in charge, not the world. Jesus Christ is in charge, not Satan and his, his children, his ministers. Okay. Jesus Christ is in charge. That's what that cross is for. Anytime something comes on to try to get in the way of you and the Lord, it goes on the cross. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Brethren, keep always pointing this out. It's great. It says your reasonable service. God's not asking the impossible. Some people start acting like, oh, it's just so hard to clean up my life. It's just so... It's... God's not asking the impossible. If you're still in wickedness and sin and worldliness, it's because you refuse to give it up, brother says Christ. If you're doing things the flesh's way, the world's way, Satan's way, rewarding evil with evil, railing for railing, all that stuff we talked about, mocking, name-calling... It's because you refuse to give that stuff up. You refuse to do things God's way. You refuse to let Jesus get back on the cross, or back on the throne, and you're putting him back on the cross. It's your reasonable service. It's reasonable. Why did why'd you even get saved, Brother Sis Christ? Why'd you get saved? So you can continue in sin? So you can continue displeasing God? Continue doing the, the, the sin and wickedness and worldliness that was sending you to hell and to the lake of fire? Did you get saved so you could have a free pass to continue doing it? Some people did. They didn't get really saved. But they think they did. And they did it so they could continue in their sin and living however they want. And now they've got that insurance policy that they get to go to heaven when they die. But this is Christ. I didn't get saved so I could continue in my sin. Sin was what sent, which was sin is what was sending me to hell and then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Sin was what put a wall between me and God, put me at, at odds against God, made me an enemy of God. It's reasonable that after a man gets saved, he is born again. His heartfelt desires, I don't want sin anymore. I don't want the world's way. The world's way was leading me to hell. If you're truly saved and born again, you found God's way. And this is what your heart desire is. Can you still fail God sometimes? Yes, you can. I have. We just read there. Repent, forsake, get your back to your walk with, with God. 
Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You present your body a living sacrifice. Once again, that's what communion's about. You come to God to make sure that those bad things, the wrong way, the you know, doctrines of devils, uh, lies, the lust of the flesh, worldliness, idolatry, anger, with or without a cause, throw it on the cross. Let God deal with the person. If you're angry with the cause, God will deal with them. If you're angry without a cause, throw it on the cross or God will deal with you. Okay? But all these things, you throw it on the cross and let God deal with it. Okay? And you get back to your walk with the Lord and going back to the throne and listening to God show you the truth. He'll do it through great men of God, preachers. He'll do it through your own Bible reading and study and praying. Mm. Psalms 51.17. Psalms 51.17. Remember we just read there? You present your body as a living sacrifice. You know what happens in a brother's and sister's in Christ's life? You have to get very prideful, very self-willed, very prideful to kick Jesus Christ off the throne. You really do. Psalms 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So when we read there, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, you have to humble yourself. You have to come to God broken. When you repent and you forsake, you've got to come to God broken and humble yourself. Drop the pride. Drop the bitterness. Drop the hate. Drop the envy. Drop the vanity. Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I come first. You've got to humble yourself. To get Jesus Christ back on the, on the throne and you back on the cross. You have to humble yourself. When you realize you've kicked Jesus off the throne, I've had to humble myself and come back to God broken all over again. To get Jesus back on that throne. You need to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. When you get saved and born again, you are now in Christ Jesus. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Who of God has made unto us wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you humble yourself, that broken spirit, and the broken contrite heart, there's always fear involved. I fear God. I, I failed him. I did something. I went against God's commands. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's made unto us righteousness. God's, Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us, but we also put on the breastplate of righteousness, and now we represent Jesus Christ. He's on the throne, and we're going out obeying His commands and living the life that He commands us to live. So we can be a light to this dark world. Sanctification. Why did God save us? So we won't go to hell, yes. But now, after He saves us, since we belong to Him now, He's going to sanctify our life and clean up our life. That's part of being a Christian. And redemption. Remember, looking for that blessed hope? When you're looking for that blessed hope, you go through sanctification. God cleans up your life. You know why people start falling back? Well, the pride and the uh, self-will. But people take their eyes off of that blessed hope. You take your eyes off that blessed hope, and you let that stuff start coming back in. The whole point of looking for that blessed hope the Bible talks about, it talks about cleaning up, keeping your life clean. Avoiding all the things that God got out of your life. You got through the sanctification, now it's time for redemption. You're looking every day for that blessed hope. Jesus could come back tomorrow. Don't let any of that stuff come back in, brother says Christ. Don't let it back in. And if you find some new things that God finally reveals to you, saying, hey, this ain't right or that ain't right, get it out of your life. Get your walk with God right. Be pleasing in His eyes. Right? That's the whole point. He made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And easy believism, they don't want you to fear God. They take that out. And their wisdom is based off the world's wisdom. Not God's wisdom. They're, right, they're, not, they're not representing Jesus Christ. 
the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They're representing a fake Jesus Christ, an antichrist, Satan, that's okay with sin, that's okay with worldliness and idolatry. Sanctification, oh, there doesn't have to be a changed life with the easy believism. And redemption? Oh, I make a mess of my... I've heard brethren say this. There's nothing God can't solve in your life in two seconds. No matter how much you've messed up your life, God, there's nothing God can do that can't... He can solve it in two seconds with the catching away of the body of Christ. Uh, that's not supposed to be your attitude. It was mine sometimes. And then I realized that's the wrong attitude. I'm not supposed to be messing my life up to begin with. You don't want to mess your life up, brothers and Christ. But let's say, like me, there's times in my life I've messed my life up. I made some bad decisions. I let sin back into my life. The old man, I compromised for worldliness, got into a little idolatry, and you make a mess of your life. You need to come to the, you need to come to the cross and tell Jesus, get back on the throne. Forgive me, get back on the throne. That's where you belong. I kicked you off. I was wrong to kick you off. Lord, help me. Help me get through this and clean all this up. All that I can clean up. Help me clean up. Help me get right with you. That's the right attitude. The wrong attitude is just saying, I don't care. I'm just going to stay in this mess and just say, Lord, why don't you come? Lord, please come. Lord, please come. That's the wrong attitude. True redemption, true looking for that blessed hope is getting your life right with God because he can come back any day now. That's what looking for that blessed hope is. Getting your heart right with the Lord. Not just messing up your life and then saying, oh, God's just going to make everything go away like that. Now, don't get me wrong. There's going to be a lot of brethren who have messed up their life that when Jesus does come, he's going to catch them in a fallen state when they could have gotten back to a standing state before he came, they decide to stay in a fallen state and just whine and complain. and Oh, Lord, why won't you come? Why won't you come? Oh, Lord Jesus, come now. And he's going to catch them flat on their face. And the Bible's got their number. The Bible says that in God's ha God knows them that are his. In God's house, there's not only gold and silver, but wood and earth. Uh, uh, vessels of gold, I'm sorry, vessels of gold and silver and vessels of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. Are you going to be that one, that vessel that's to dishonor? Or do you want to be that vessel that's to honor? So looking for that blessed hope means you need to make sure that your life lines up with this book, and that you're living for Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is on the throne, and you're on the cross. It's just that simple. Verse 31, when Jesus is on that throne, verse 31, that according as is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now it says here, God has made unto us. You mean that God is sitting on the throne? God made unto us these things when he saved us. He gets on the throne and he shows us wisdom. We learn fear of the Lord at salvation. If you didn't fear God at salvation, you didn't have true repentance. That comes in with the fear. If you fear God... And you humble yourself. Okay. But righteousness, sanctification, redemption, God makes us these things. And if Jesus is on the throne, we're submitting to him so he can make us these things. He can make us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Looking for that, help, help us to look more for that blessed hope at the life that we're leaving to keep things out. Help us live more for him through sanctification, getting that wickedness out. Being a better light for him in this world when there's a lot of counterfeit lights today. There's a lot of counterfeit lights that are dull. They're not the same as the sun. The real light that came from Jesus Christ, that light that Moses had that, that reflected off of him, that people couldn't look in his face because he had been with God. Oh yeah. It takes humbling yourself and coming to God broken, even after salvation, to take correction and get sanctification from the Word of God, from brethren. Take correction from brethren, from the Word of God. It takes humbling yourself, brothers to Christ. It takes humbling yourself. Today, a lot of brethren, they're, they're being taught to be prideful and puffed up, and they won't take correction unless it comes from their respecter of persons. But God, when you least expect it, will bring somebody into your life that's a Bible-believing, God-fearing person 
to show you the scriptures where you're wrong? Are you going to listen? No, no, I'm of that man and I'm only going to go the direction that man goes. Is Jesus on the throne and you on the cross? Proverbs 3.11, Proverbs 3.11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Do you humble yourself? Brother says Christ, I've taken correction where I'm still right and they're wrong. You say, well, how do you do that? If they come to me saying I'm wrong, I take time and I spend some time with the Lord and say, Lord, am I wrong? Even if it's just for a second, not because I'm doubting myself, I come to the Lord, I come to the cross, I come to His Word, because I want the attitude that you can have the world, enemies, servants of Satan, trying to tell you you're wrong about everything. I know men in ministry, I try to have grace for them, that I understand that they go through where everyone is attacking them and telling them they're wrong. But you know what they do wrong? I will tell you this, because I'm, like I said, one of those people. They build up calluses to the point where they won't take correction from anyone. They take it too far the wrong direction. And they become above accountability, above correction. And they won't take correction at all. Okay? I'm trying to have the attitude. Someone came to me and said, it's post-trib. I said, okay, let's talk for, uh, we, we talked for two hours, two times on Skype. It was a young man, and I pray he's saved, and he's just misguided. Okay. But we sat there, and I knew that, that it's wrong. I've studied the issue, but I still sat with him, and I talked to him about dispensational teaching. Evidently, he's not dispensational. He kept going to Matthew 24. I said, that's Old Testament. Show me in the Pauline epistles where we go through the time of Jacob's trouble, where God's going to pour out his wrath on his own body. I said, show me this stuff. I showed in the Pauline epistles where Paul says we're not appointed to God's wrath. We are going to be leaving before the man of sin is revealed. The time of Jacob's trouble starts. We're going to be gone. I showed him that stuff. And he refused to accept it. Part of me believes he was a respecter of person. He's following some guy that's telling him it's post-trib. He's not following the word of God. But I took the correction to the point where I corrected him. Now, I've had brethren hit me up with corrections, and, and there's times where they are right. They're right, and I have to take that correction. I got, I'm always fearful, brothers of Christ, that if I get into ministry too much, and I want to, uh, like full-time ministry, I don't want the worship of men. I don't want to be popular. I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be, you know, something that they start worshiping me and putting me on that, cro on that uh, throne. I don't want that. I want to be able to take correction, and there's times where I have been wrong. And when I'm not, I believe I'm 100% right, I still take the correction and I take that correction to God and say, okay, this is how they're trying to correct me. I know they're wrong, but I still go to God and talk to them about it to humble myself. And then I go back to that person, not with, I'm not wrong, you're wrong. I go back to that person with trying to show them the truth and say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? What about this? And I try to show them the truth. And if they don't want the truth, they go their own way. I don't lose my temper, praise God. Uh, bitterness doesn't build up hate, angry without a cause, or angry with a cause, that turns to bitterness if you hold on to it long enough, and turns into hate. But this is Christ, we need to work hard not to be above correction. Now don't get me wrong, if there's a wolf in sheep's clothing, I'm not really going to heed him that much mind. What I mean by correction, more than anything, is brethren. I'm not talking about a wolf in sheep's clothing. If... Uh, Robert Breaker, or Gene Kim, or uh, Steve Anderson, these guys are pretty old names now. I think Gene Kim's still popular, and Peter, uh, Paul, um, Robert Breaker is still kind of popular. But if they, him, or people that are following a false gospel that worship these men, if they try to correct me, eh, who cares? I'm not really going to pay them much heed. What I'm talking about correction is brethren, Bible-believing, Bible God-fearing men, Men that I believe are saved, men that, you know, I believe have lost their way. Some of them have lost their way. But you still need to have the attitude to take correction. I know I'm kind of going off a little bit, forgive me, brothers and Christ, but you need to take correction. Be careful of those brethren that their, their, idea, their way of trying to escape taking correction is that anybody that corrects them, they're automatically lost. 
They could be. They could be. But you shouldn't have that default mode where they're automatically lost because they're correcting me. That's men in ministry that's gotten very puffed up with themselves. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. They're very puffed up. They're very prideful. They've forgotten who's on the throne and who's supposed to be on the cross. They've forgotten, brother says Christ. Bottom line, it's God's way that matters. God and his perfect written word come first. Your walk with him comes second. Then, if you're in ministry, that comes third. Then the, uh, then the brethren, fourth. The lost world, fifth. If you're not in ministry, then you just take that one out. Then the brethren come third. Then the lost world, fourth. You come last. I'm telling you, as brothers and sisters Christ, all the division, everything that's happened in the body of Christ when it comes to division, Satan comes in, two things. Satan comes in and starts sowing seeds of destruction. He likes to counterfeit Jesus Christ. What did we do? We sow seeds of truth. He sows seeds of lies and destruction. Okay? He brings in these lies and everything, and he causes division in the body of Christ. But ultimately, ultimately, what the brethren have to let him do it. Ultimately. So what it comes down to, brothers and Christ, is you've got brethren in the, in the ministry, you've got brethren in the body of Christ, that me, myself, and I come first. And they've gotten so prideful, so uh, self-willed, that they've kicked Jesus off the throne. They've kicked Jesus off the throne. And that's what, remember, only by pride cometh contention. That's what causes division in the body of Christ. You've got men and women that are just so prideful, they won't submit themselves to God anymore. That's that vessel to wood and earth. That vessel that's dishonorable. That's dishonoring God. Okay. Let's go ahead and wrap this up, brothers and Christ. The cost of Jesus being on the throne and you on the cross can and will be great in these last days. I've always said this. Salvation is a gift. God's grace is a gift. You've got to find that grace. How do you find that grace? Through faith. And doing and repentance, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer, and asking God to save you. It's a free gift. After salvation, it's going to cost you to live a life of Christ. It's going to cost you to walk with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's going to cost you sin, sanctification. It's going to cost you the world. Be not conformed to this world. Love not the world. You have to be a friend of the world. You're going to lose family and friends are going to turn against you. You might lose a wife. You might lose a husband. You might lose your children to the world. I do. You're going to lose brethren that turn on you. Some of them are going to turn on you like ravening wolves. It makes you wonder. I believe they're saved, but that sometimes it makes you wonder, are they saved? Why would they turn on you like a ravening wolf? It's going to cost you, brothers and Christ, to make sure that Jesus is on the throne and His Word is what you're living by and you have that cross and you take that cross with you daily. Putting down the flesh. Anytime something comes in that gets in the way of you worshiping Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart, you got to throw it on the cross and get rid of it. Get rid of it. Now, losing sin is great, but for some, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for some. To really learn how to put the flesh down. You know, you know one of the great things about fasting? I would actually suggest the brethren get into fasting. Even if it's just one day a week. Get into fasting where you don't eat any food for one day. One day. It's not hard. It's not a lot hard request. Just one day. What does that do? That helps you put the, the flesh in check. It helps you put the flesh down. It really does. Right. It helps you remember that day you spend that day with the Lord and His Word. And you talk to the Lord about anything and everything that's on your heart. Take a day where you fast and you spend time in prayer. Right. I put on here also losing lost family members and friends. I talked about that. Having to part ways with brethren. That I still pray for all the brethren that ever that either just disappeared, one minute they're there, the next minute they're gone, because I'm, most of my fellowship is online. Uh, I don't have any brothers in this area. So one minute they're there, the next minute they're gone. Okay. Some have turned on me. Okay. 
I still pray for him. I still love him. But there's a cost, brothers and Christ. There's a cost for making sure that Jesus Christ is on the throne and that this word is hiding in your, hidden in your heart and you're living it. And putting anything on the cross that gets in the way of your walk with the Lord and living for Jesus Christ and being a, ser a good servant to the brethren. I've lost a lot of things down here. I'm not going to go into uh, put, uh, a look at me thinks. Those are my rewards in heaven. I've lost a lot of things down here, brothers and sisters in Christ. People I love and care about. And when push comes to self, brothers and sisters Christ, I'm going through some old videos about brethren in the past where they actually gave their life for the Word of God. Okay? They actually had to die for Jesus Christ. If it ever comes down to it, brother says Christ, would you die for Jesus Christ? I, I'm going to be honest with you, brother says Christ. In these last days, I think, I seem to, when I talk with the Lord, I'm like, Lord, it seems like it's a lot easier to die for you today than it is to live for you. Back in the past, when I'm listen, listening about the martyrs in the past, they really wanted to live for Jesus Christ. It was, it was a tough thing to die. Like I said, if your family turns on you, you lose your family. If the world turns on you, you lose the world. If the flesh tries to get you, you put the flesh down and say it's not worth it. And you wind up dying for Jesus Christ. And it was a hard thing to die for Jesus Christ. Today, you hear so many people say, I died for Jesus Christ, I died for Jesus Christ. That might be true, that might not be true. They're just all talk. Remember? Talk and walk. Uh, but today, it just seems like it's easier to say, I'll die for Jesus Christ than it is to say, I, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. It just seems that with how wicked this world is, the condition of the body of Christ today, with the falling away, it's harder to live for Jesus Christ today. You're so tempted to compromise. You're so tempted to give in. Brothers says Christ, if you have to give your life for Jesus Christ, it'll. It, when someone says, I give my life for Jesus Christ, are you living for Him? That's evidence that you'll give your life for Him if you're living for Him. If you're not living for him and they say, I die for Jesus Christ, they're liars and they're deceivers. But it seems today living for Jesus Christ is a lot harder than dying for him. If they want to cut my head off, go for it. You know, I, I, of course I chose an easy way, but that there's burning at the stake. There's all, also torture and then burning you at the stake. I mean, there's firing squad. There's a lot of ways to die for Jesus Christ, but it just seems like I die for Jesus Christ. What I'm working on now and struggling with off and on is living for Jesus Christ. Making sure Jesus Christ is on that throne. How are you guys doing, brothers and sisters Christ? How are you doing? How is your walk with the Lord going, brothers and Christ? Is He on the throne and you're carrying that cross around so you can throw everything on that cross that gets in the way of your walk with the Lord? Or somehow, some way, either you or somebody else is on that throne and Jesus got kicked off and now he's back on the cross. God will get you to doubt your salvation to get you back to living right with him. You know the number one reason that people doubt their salvation? They're not living for Jesus Christ. Just something to think about. I'll leave you with this, okay, brothers of Christ? Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fell, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. That's an image of saying, there's nothing that's worth coming between me and you. There's nothing that I have that is more important than you are, Lord. This is all yours. You gave us this reward, but even this reward you gave us is not worth becoming between me and you. They throw their crowns before the throne, and they're worshiping Him. And they're saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. Hebrews 11.5, Hebrews 11.5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. 
Are you pleasing God, brothers and sisters? Is Jesus on the throne and you're carrying your cross around? Or did you drop your cross and you kick Jesus off the throne and now Jesus has to get back on the cross to remind you why you got saved? Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, brothers and sisters of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for the patience of watching through these series of videos and please, please, please keep me in your prayers. I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'd love to hear from you. There's the email, ministry email, ministry P.O. box on the About tab of this channel, and you guys can make comments. Leave comments, show me some verses, show, you can tell, give me testimonies, and encourage me and the brethren on how God helped you overcome kicking him off the throne. Please, by all means, give us some good testimonies. Okay? Encourage the brethren to live for Jesus Christ. So... I will leave that there, and I will see you guys in the next study.